Greetings, everyone. Welcome to live lecture number seven for Business Analytics 6356. Let me tell you what, it is hard to believe we are already in the month of October and finally here in Houston, we're getting weather that is a little bit more fall-like, a little bit more bearable. Even though a little bit wet today, I think we have uh, the temperature on the decline, hopefully, fingers crossed. But here in cyberspace in the Zoom room on the internet, I suppose we're all kind of the same, uh, same temperature and in the same climate. And that climate is a climate of non-relational databases. And I'm super glad to have you all here with me tonight. So, uh, and you know, interestingly enough, before we get into the welcome stuff, uh, live lecture number, well, where's my hand here? <laughs> live lecture number seven here, uh, we have just 15 class meetings throughout the semester. So we are at about the halfway point of the semester, right? And also we're going to be covering seven databases this semester, and this is our third database that we're covering now with MongoDB. Next week, we'll be uh, covering our fourth database of CouchDB. So uh, yeah, and we're approaching the kind of midway point with our case project presentation uh, first round. So yeah, and really every way of looking at things, we are about at the midpoint of the semester. So in, uh, in many ways, it feels like we're just getting started, but we have, of course, covered a lot of ground and, uh, and introduced a lot of new concepts and, and uh, great things for you all. So I hope everything is going well and you're keeping on top of things and whatnot. And uh, speaking on, of keeping on top of things, uh, in preparation for tonight, uh, you should have watched video series seven, which is uh, just under an hour of content. Uh, that talks about various different ways to import data into MongoDB. It talks about some advanced querying and using aggregation pipelines and things like that, as well as talking a little bit about the uh, kind of infrastructure of MongoDB and how replication works and uh, some of the technical details there that enable MongoDB to deal with very big data and scale uh, not just out, but also scale or not just scale up, but also scale out to having many MongoDB servers in your environment to give you this ultimate uh, kind of geographical uh, geographical diversity and, uh, and a lot of uh, redundancy. So a lot of really great things that were covered in video series seven there. Uh, since you've already read the, uh, the material about uh, document databases for last week, there were no new readings. Uh, and then we talked about this a bit last week as well. Uh, but you know, if you had the opportunity to install MongoDB in an EC2 instance in AWS, I think that is a really great experience. And I also asked all of the groups to sign up for a time to meet one-on-one -on -one with me to discuss what you're planning on doing for your case project. And uh, last time I checked, three out of the four groups had identified a time slot, so I'll be reaching out to uh, those groups with a Zoom link that we can use to have that meeting. And then the uh, fourth group, please uh, take a look at the available time slots or send me an email directly and let me know uh, a time that will work and we'll, uh, we'll work something out uh, there. So since we've had already the uh, 55, oh, I keep doing my weatherman act backwards. Since we've already had our uh, almost an hour of asynchronous content, I expect class will be you know an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes something like that tonight to round out our three hours for the evening. So uh, I do want to talk since we are at about the midpoint of the semester, just a little bit about the upcoming schedule and kind of what's happening between now and the end of the semester. And then uh, we'll do kind of a brief recap of the videos and extend some of that uh, learning. Uh, we're going to take a little bit more uh, critical look at the uh, Amazon Musical Instruments Review data set, as well as introduce a new, much larger data set uh, where we're going to be looking at nutritional information with this Open Food Facts database, which has over a million uh, documents in the collection. And we're going to see uh, kind of how we can interact with that, uh, which will lead us directly into our discussion of assignment three and a little bit of demo and really get you uh, put on the way to success uh, there. So assignment three was posted to Canvas uh, just a couple of hours ago. 
And uh, what we do tonight in class will set you well on the way to uh, being able to complete that. So that is the agenda for tonight. So as far as schedule stuff goes, of course, uh, tonight is October 3rd and we are in our second week of discussing document databases and our second week discussing MongoDB. So this will be our last class focusing on MongoDB. We will be continuing our discussion of document databases next week on October 10th, but with a different document database, uh, CouchDB. So uh, we're still gonna be interacting with like JSON documents. We're still gonna be using that skill a lot, but uh, there's a little bit different uh, kind of management and replication philosophy behind uh, CouchDB and it winds up being a really um, a very interesting DBMS to uh, to interact with. So a really nice class next week where we will be setting up some uh, replication between a local CouchDB instance and our shared instance and uh, creating uh, map reduce jobs and queries and things like that. It's going to be a going to be a great show. Can't wait for you to tune in for uh, for that. And then two weeks from tonight on October 17th, we'll have our first round of case project presentations. So um, like I mentioned earlier, over the next couple of days, I'm going to be meeting with uh, each one of the groups and making sure you've identified a reasonable data set that's going to be uh, uh, you know, good for asking and answering some interesting questions uh, for the course. Uh, but on October 17th, uh, we won't be having a traditional lecture where I'm presenting anything. Uh, you all will be running the presentations for the entirety of class. And uh, we will be in class for almost that entire three hour period uh, as we have four groups, each doing about 30 minutes and then a little bit of opening and closing material. So um, it is described in the assignment file for the case project. But on October 17th, I'm going to ask that you have all of your project materials, so your written report and whatever you're presenting, uploaded to Canvas by 5 p.m. So I have just a little bit of time to take a quick look through the projects before the uh, presentations begin. But that is two weeks out at this point. And uh, when we come back on October 24th, we will be introducing our fourth genre of non-relational database management system in the graph database and using a really cool DBMS called Neo4j. So graph databases are probably the most different of all of the databases that we're going to be talking about this semester. It's just a very different way of thinking about data management and really being more interested in the relationships between data elements rather than the data elements themselves, right? And this is weird because most of our non-relational databases don't even have the concept of creating relationships between data elements, right? We do that in a relational database, but not really anywhere else except for these graph databases. So it's a really cool technology, something that, uh, I don't know, I think it's one of the most fun and exciting uh, couple of nights we have in the class. So um, on October 24th, when we introduce graph databases, we will also be having our first exam readiness quiz. So those of you that have me for Business Analytics 6354 or MIS 7373, you are perhaps familiar with the exam readiness quiz, but this is just a you know short quiz. We'll spend maybe 10 minutes or so in class uh, doing this where you'll see some questions from a previous semester's exam and kind of get a feel for uh, the types of questions I'm going to ask and then on the exam and then also, you know, kind of test your understanding of how things are going up to this point. But it will be kind of similar to the in-class exercises we've already done. So, you know, as long as you have a good grasp of the material we've covered so far, not something to stress about uh, tremendously. The week following that on October 31st, uh, I actually am not going to be available during class time that evening. Uh, but since this is an online course that's been offered for several semesters at this point, I do fortunately have recordings of all of the lectures from previous semesters. And this one in particular is, uh, is a quite 
nice lecture. So uh, I think it actually works well in the asynchronous format because the, uh, the content that was presented there is very uh, kind of clear and, and well done. And I think you will really enjoy watching that. But I will make the uh, asynchronous video available uh, sometime before October 31st and you can kind of watch that at your leisure. On November 7th, we'll be moving into our fifth and final genre of DBMS, the key value database. And we're going to be talking about two key value databases. First, Redis, which is an extremely high performance in-memory database where we measure the speed of transactions not in milliseconds or thousandths of a second, but in microseconds or millionths. Of a second. So we're talking about transactions that are going to be running uh, perhaps you know hundreds of times faster than they might in, a, uh, in other DBMSs. So Redis is a cool thing to look at. And then uh, on November 14th, we'll be looking at Amazon's DynamoDB, which is not quite the same level of performance of Re as Redis, but still a very high performance database management system, but also one that is effectively infinitely scalable on a global scale because it's built on top of Amazon's AWS uh, network infrastructure, which is literally encompasses the entire world and is made up of millions upon millions of uh, computers. So a really neat, uh, you know, cloud native technology there that just literally couldn't have existed 20 years ago before this, uh, you know, humongous AWS infrastructure uh, was built. So very cool technology there. And then on November 21st, we'll uh, have a little bit of time to kind of wrap up and look at things holistically. We'll talk about this concept of polyglot persistence, wherein we use multiple database management systems kind of in concert together so that we can get kind of a benefit that's bigger than the sum of their parts and perhaps avoid some of the uh, shortcomings and, uh, and shortfalls of the individual databases. We'll also talk about some emerging database technologies that we're not focusing on in this class, things like time series databases and blockchain databases, and just kind of think about the future of uh, data management. So a nice uh, wrap up there on November 21st. We'll also, covering up the screen here, also be having our second exam readiness quiz. Uh, we'll kind of structure that as a bit of a review session, uh, really making sure everyone is prepped for the final exam, uh, which is I believe scheduled to be held on December 13th. I need to go back and double check this because I think there was a change in the exam schedule and I'm not sure this is what the syllabus says. So let me double, triple check the, uh, the time of the final exam and I'll uh, make sure that everyone's in sync on that. Uh, but before the final exam, of course, we will have our second and final case project presentation here on November 28th. So the idea there is that you'll take what you did in part one of the case project and extend that by incorporating one or more additional data sets and one or more additional uh, database management systems. So often this takes the form of maybe incorporating some uh, Neo4j and some graph queries and things like that, but a lot of different options for how you might proceed there. So that is kind of what we're doing from now until the end of the semester. Any, any comments, questions, or concerns about anything? And of course you can unmute yourself or I've got my chat window pulled up here so you could drop a message in the chat. Just let me know. Yeah, Professor, uh, I was just asking if you only have two quizzes and one exam throughout the semester? Yes, just the two exam readiness quizzes and the one uh, final exam. There's no midterm or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and move into the content. And of course, we, uh, we covered this last week. We said, you know, MongoDB, we're talking about document databases dealing with big data, humongous data, that's where the name MongoDB comes from, but even more 
uh, kind of specific to MongoDB and document databases in general, dealing with data in an object-oriented manner, okay? So we're gonna continue to see this week and next that we're going to be talking a lot about objects and using JSON and, uh, and things like that. So we get uh, you know, very high performance, good scalability. Um, we don't have the strong guarantee of consistency like we had with HBase because as we discussed, HBase has that shared disk architecture with HDFS where all servers can access the same data at the same time. Whereas MongoDB and most of the non-relational databases we're talking about have this shared nothing architecture where they all have their individual disk and when data is written to one database server, it's temporarily going to be out of sync or inconsistent with the other databases in that environment until that data is replicated over the network. So there's gonna be some period of time that we don't have consistency, right? But we kind of trade off uh, that strong consistency for having a high level of, uh, of scalability and, uh, and resiliency. So in the videos so far, the asynchronous lecture series six and seven, and what we talked about last week, we've talked about the idea that MongoDB is great for dealing with big data, really focused on object-oriented mindset, and everything we do with MongoDB is kind of object based, right? Our data is stored in JSON objects. As we pass, uh, as we pass arguments into the commands, we do so in a kind of a JSON format, right? Uh, we're interacting with MongoDB using like little JavaScript commands. And we even saw in lecture 7.1, how we can write like JavaScript scripts JavaScript scripts or basically functions to uh, kind of extend the functionality of MongoDB. So some really uh, great stuff there. We looked at our basic create, read, update, and delete operations. And we looked at importing data in a JSON and CSV format. So we're gonna kind of build on some of this data import knowledge tonight. And I'm gonna show you some additional ways to get data to the server. And, uh, and yeah, just some kind of extension of this uh, of this thinking. So I believe this slide was also in last week's lectures, but I think uh, it's always nice to have kind of a cheat sheet like this for your uh, for your basic operations handy. So I thought I would go ahead and include it in this week's lecture as well, but we're not going to be uh, dwelling on this. So in the uh, in the asynchronous content, we looked at three different ways to import our data. So we said we can create a, a, a JavaScript file. So this uh, .js is a JavaScript script file that's made up of a whole bunch of uh, MongoDB commands. We can uh, use the load command in MongoDB to execute all the commands in that script. And uh, that was one way to get data into a collection in MongoDB, okay? Probably a more common and useful way though, is using this mongo import command, okay? And so uh, in the asynchronous videos, we, uh, we saw this, uh, this JSON file full of Amazon reviews of uh, 10,000 and some musical instruments that's available on uh, Kaggle. So we uploaded that to the server using PSFTP and then use the Mongo import command to import that into, you know, whatever database and whatever collection it is we are interested in. And then similarly, we demonstrated how we can import a CSV file. So CSV isn't really the like native format for MongoDB or for a document database. So we did have to make some additional specifications here, like describing that this is a CSV file and that the first row describes the names of the attributes or in, in the document, the fields uh, that the data describes. So that is, uh, you know, that's kind of what we did in the asynchronous videos. And we used PSFTP because of course you first must get to the data to this server somehow. And uh, we've used this tool several times now and hopefully we're getting kind of familiar with it. Um, but of course there are other ways to get data on to a server. And one 
challenge that you may experience uploading data to our server if you're on like a residential internet connection, like from your house, as opposed to being from campus or, or from your work or something like that, is that most residential internet is structured such that you have a relatively high download speed. You have a lot of download bandwidth, but your upload speed is relatively slow because that's the way that kind of is the common use case for you know most, most consumers, right? When you access a website, you are uploading a very small amount of data to that web server. You're uploading like a string of text that says, this is the website I would like to see. The web server processes that and then sends you back a relatively large amount of data, which is all the contents of the website, right? The text that's on the website, the, the pictures, the sounds, the movies, the whatever is present on that website. So you uploaded to the website a small amount of data and it sent you back a larger amount of data, right? And if you think about like how you interact with Netflix, okay, when you interact with Netflix, you send Netflix, you upload to Netflix a small amount of data, like the identifier of the movie it is you wanna see. I wanna see movie number 15725, right? Netflix then goes and fetches that movie and you download that movie from Netflix as it's being streamed to you. So you uploaded like a few kilobytes of data to Netflix and then you download multiple gigabytes of data as you're streaming that movie, okay? From Netflix's perspective, it's actually the reverse, right? Netflix is downloading from you a very small amount of data and then uploading to you a very large amount of data, right? That entire movie. So it's kind of the opposite access pattern. So the reason I'm pointing this out is because if you find a you know, rather large data source on something like Kaggle or data.gov or whatever, it might take you, you know, 10 minutes to download this. But then when you go to upload that to the server, it might take like seven or eight hours to upload. Because like my connection, I have a seven or 600 megabit download, but only 20 megabits of upload, right? So it can be a little bit tricky getting this data re-uploaded somewhere else. And throughout the project, I don't want to be like struggling with slow uploads or downloads or anything like that to be a problem. So if you, if you experience some issue like that, you know, let me know and we can figure out a better way to get to the data to the server. If you're on campus, your upload speed is going to be much faster. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But another thing we might consider is just asking for that file directly from the server instead of first downloading it to your computer and then uploading it to the server. So I'm gonna demonstrate a way we can do this using this utility called curl. And so, okay, there we go. Using this utility called curl. So what curl does is basically makes a request to a web server in a way that is very similar to what your web browser does, and then just shows you the results that the web uh, server sent back. And in this request with curl, you can actually request a specific file like a CSV file or a JSON file or whatever, as long as you know the URL, right? And that's why URL is capitalized in curl, right? Because we're interacting with URLs, uniform resource locator, okay? This is just exactly what the thing you type in the address bar of your browser, your Chrome or Safari or Microsoft Edge or whatever, right? So let's demonstrate Kind of what's uh, what's going on here? So um, so whenever you go to a website, right, like uh, www.bower.uh.edu, you're sending a request to this web server asking for the website, and it sends that website back to you, and uh, and your web browser processes that HTML to show you this uh, this nice pretty website. So we can use curl to do a similar thing. You say curl, HTTPS, 
power.uh.edu. And this doesn't look much like a website, right? We just saw a bunch of, we see a bunch of code scroll by, but this is all the HTML code that makes up this, you know, beautiful multimedia experience that is the new uh, Bauer website. And if we scroll up to the beginning where this kind of starts, well, this is very, very long. Right, you see here at the top, it says, you know, the title of this website is the C.T. Bauer of College Business at the University of Houston, which is, you know, what you see right up here at the, you know, title of the, uh, of the web page. Uh, this is, uh, you know, some kind of information for, you know, loading the JavaScript and uh, different things like that. As we uh, scroll down just a little bit, you see like here's events calendar, giving, contact, login to access UH, like these are these uh, menu items that are right here at the top of the web page. And if we were to like right click here and say view page source, so this is what the web server actually sent back to your computer. And this is just exactly the same thing that we're seeing uh, when we use curl, right? It's just that curl is showing us the raw output from the web server, whereas this, your web browser receives this code and interprets it to present this beautiful website back to you, right? So this is at a very high level kind of what's going on with curl. Curl is used to ask a website to return some, uh, some content to us, right? So what I have done, I want to get the US County's CSV file onto the server, right? And if we look, let me just kind of verify that in my directory, yeah, I have my open food facts database, the reviews, the students file that we used in the asynchronous video, but no US counties.csv file. So I have actually loaded this onto a web server that I uh, manage at this URL right here. So by running this command, curl, and then the URL that points to this uh, CSV file, and then saying that I want to output this into a CSV file on the computer, it will download this just like I was clicking on a link in the uh, on a web page. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm just copying and pasting from my from my uh, content that's in the slides here. Curl the URL output to uscounties.csv. When I hit enter, this reaches out to my web server. It takes only you know less than a second or so to download this because it's just 670k and the uh, you know Amazon AWS servers sit on a very fast network connection, so it took virtually no time there. I look at the contents of my directory again. I see I do now have this uscounties.csv file. Uh, if I were to say nano uscounties.csv, here's all that data that should at this point be looking pretty familiar, right? Good. So I've got the data now downloaded to my MongoDB server. Now we need to import it into MongoDB. And let me make sure that it's not already there. So I'm gonna go into MongoDB. Um, I didn't specify a database I wanted to connect to, so I'm gonna to need to connect to a database before I do anything else. Uh, this mg underscore UHDB is what I'm gonna be using. It uh, looks like several of you have also created your own databases, which is great. So I'm gonna say use mg underscore UHDB. And I'll show collections. And I have my Amazon reviews collection. I have my students collection, but I don't have a collection for US counties. Good, so that's what we're going to create right now. So I'm gonna use the mongo import command. I'm gonna say dash dash db equals mg underscore uhdb, because that's my destination database. My collection is going to be US counties. I could call that whatever, but that you know makes sense given this context. And I'm gonna say the file I'm importing is home mgrimes uscounties.csv. 
Since this is a CSV file, we have to specify the type of file is CSV. And since it has that header line at the top describing the attributes, we say dash dash header line. And when we hit enter, it takes just, you know, not even a second. It says 3,220 documents imported successfully, zero failed import. That's good. So I'm gonna say Mongo UH underscore, or MG underscore UHDB. Show collections. There's my US counties collection. So if I said uh, db.uscounties.count, 3,220 documents just as expected. Yeah, and there's all the, uh, all the data, right? Uh, let's say county is Harris County. We see all of our data about our Harris County, Georgia, and our Harris County, Texas. We wanted to project just certain attributes. We could do that here. So we could say, let's project oops, county and state. Can't type today. State and total pop. And let's not project ID because that's projected by default. We don't specify not to. Oh, what did I mess up? Oh, I didn't close my, okay, there we go. Oh no, it's gonna make me type all that again. It's pretty lame. I'm just gonna, there we go. It's upset that I didn't close this curly brace here, right? So now that's a well-formed object. So yeah, here we go. We're projecting our state, our county, and the total population of counties that have a value of Harris County for the county attribute. Good stuff. So we've already interacted quite a bit with the uh, U.S. counties data set, so I don't want to really belabor that point. I do want to look just a little bit more at the Amazon reviews data set because I think it is a really... Uh, it's a really neat data set. And then we're gonna move on to the new Open Food Facts data set, which we, uh, which we haven't seen before, and get a little bit of additional um, exposure to that. So if I say, I remember still in my same MGUHDB database, I have three collections, reviews, students, and US counties. So reviews is the collection I'm interested in now. Uh, now we can see here there are 10,261 documents in this collection. Um, right, so each one of these documents Oops. Oh, I didn't really mean to have everything scroll across. But anyway, each one of these documents represents a review for a product on Amazon. And some of, the, some of the products have multiple reviews. So this isn't exactly 10,000 products because I think on average the products have like five or six reviews. So it's probably more like 2,000 products uh, that each have a handful of reviews, but 10,000 or so reviews in total. Uh, we have this unique identifier of the document. We have a reviewer ID, so that is the person that left the review. Uh, we have this ASIN, which is an Amazon like product ID number. We're gonna be looking at that in a little more depth in just a moment. The name of the reviewer, how helpful the review was, I think on a scale of a one to five, the text of the review, the overall like number of stars, a summary of the review, the Unix Epoch timestamp at which the review was left. So we've seen this pop up several times uh, in different DBMSs at this point. And then a more uh, kind of human, intelligible uh, representation of the date of the review. So I assume this is July 16th to 2014 that this uh, review was left. So 
one of the things we did in the asynchronous video was to look at the Well, let's talk about the ASIN just a little bit first. So um, we looked at the like five star reviews, right? So we did, oops. So we did something like this where we did a DB reviews, db.reviews.find, then use this filter to say we only want to see our reviews um, we only want to see our five star reviews here. And then we projected the uh, ASIN, the, uh, the ranking, which is always going to be five here. And then the summary of the review, right? So we saw these products come up and we described that we can look at this ASIN Oops, I did not mean to, didn't mean to exit out, right? So we can grab this uh, ASIN value and actually there we go. There we go. And actually like paste that in to our search in Amazon and that will like pull up that uh, that product, right? Which is uh, which is kind of neat, right? That we can just you know based on the contents in this database, we can find products. And I don't remember if this is in the asynchronous videos or not, but. I also said, instead of just searching, we can go to like amazon.com slash DP and put this uh, ASIN value here at the end. And that will be a URL directly to that product. That is so incredibly random <laughs> that I just picked a random product out of this data set and I have purchased this product before. Wow. <laughs> of the millions and millions of products on Amazon and the thousands in this data set, I promise you I did not stage this. That's uh Wow, somebody's got to run the numbers on that. <laughs> that is so wild. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so. Wow, I have to collect myself. So it's kind of cool that, you know, based on a data set like this, we could like run commands to look for products that have like certain keywords in the uh, in the reviews or certain ratings or a certain number of ratings or something like that. And we could actually like generate URLs to those products if we kind of think about and understand the structure of how, um, how the Amazon website works. And something that I did last semester in class kind of on a lark, I had never I had never tried it before, but I wanted to see what would happen is, well, couldn't we just like systematically now that we know the structure of this URL, we can just say amazon.com slash dp slash the ASIN, write curl commands to like scrape down all the data from Amazon. And yeah, that totally makes sense as something you could, uh, you could do, right? You could say curl HTTPS, uh, Amazon, oops, amazon.com slash DP slash this ASIN number and presumably like get this content, just the text of it, like pulled down to your computer. And this is a way that you could write like a, a web scraping application, right? And then you could use Python or something like that to, um, uh, to like kind of parse 
the data. And so I ran this demo in class, not knowing what would happen. And so we get this stuff back that doesn't really look like this page over here, right? And if you scroll up to the top, we get this message, like a secret kind of hidden message sent to us from Amazon, because when you interact with a web server using curl, as opposed to a regular web browser, it does look a little bit different to the web server. Now you could disguise it, you could trick the web server, but just in the default configuration, curl looks a little bit different than the web server. And so Amazon actually says, hey, we notice you're not actually a web browser that you're using something like curl, or there's a similar tool called wget or some type of scraper to try to access this. And it says, hey, if you want automated access to Amazon data, send us an email and let's see like what we can figure out because there's a lot of extra overhead to making these kinds of web calls and many websites have what they call an API or application programming interface that would be able to send you just the data you're interested in without like pulling down all the images and the headers and stuff like that. So I just thought it was kind of funny that when I you know ran this example, this demo live in class uh, last time, we, uh, we stumbled upon this. So we can't actually scrape Amazon using curl, but perhaps we could email them and ask nicely for a uh, access. And then a very strange thing happened in class tonight. It's so, so wild. All right. So, you know, this is one of the things that I do want you to take away from this class. And I mentioned this last week as well, is kind of thinking about when we see things like these Unix Epoch timestamps or these weird ID numbers or these weird, you know, kind of cryptic things in URLs, like, is this actually something that I might be able to use in some other context, right? Can I manipulate this to make this uh, do something that I'm interested in, in my pursuit of, uh, of analytics? So yeah, always be kind of keeping the, uh, keeping an eye out for that. Um, so, with these search queries, uh, so we already have talked kind of about the uh, basic, you know, find and searching for, you know, certain county names and, uh, and different uh, state names and projecting only the uh, attributes or the fields that we're interested in. And uh, we described how these queries are kind of similar to our SQL queries and how we can think about them in that same context, right? So, for example, that uh, select in the SQL that we already know is very similar to the find command in, uh, in MongoDB. Uh, the collection that we're querying is kind of similar to a table in a relational database. This part here where we're projecting these attributes in SQL, that's like what we put right here in our, uh, in our projection in the find command. And then like our where statement in SQL is kind of similar to what we put in the first part of the where command, right? So, you know, db.uscounties.find where this, where this uh, find documents that this criteria is true from and then project these attributes, very similar to this SQL statement here. So collections and tables, are not the same thing, but they're kind of similar conceptually, right? And a document and a row or a document and a tuple are not the same thing, but they are kind of conceptually similar if you want to think about it that way, okay? And then in the, uh, in the videos, we also talked about these uh, aggregation pipelines, right? Where this is similar to doing our aggregate functions using uh, group by in, uh, in SQL, right? And we said in the aggregation pipeline, uh, our dollar sign group function is uh, uh, similar to group by in SQL, dollar sign match is very similar to where, and then dollar sign sort is similar to order by. Now I say here dollar sign match is similar to where, but then back here I said like this section right here of our find command is similar to where, and both 
are true, right? You can do some kind of basic searching here and actually even beyond basic. I mean, you can do some fairly complex searching here, but when you start using your, um, your where functionality here or the match functionality here, you're able to create some kind of more complex search criteria. So, um, you know, be kind of familiar and, uh, and get comfortable using both approaches because in different situations, different scenarios, uh, you're going to get kind of different performance and benefit out of the uh, different ways you might want to do this. So we looked at some aggregate functions in the U.S. counties data set in the asynchronous videos. I want to run just a couple of more aggregation pipelines on this uh, Amazon data set though. So we can, uh, we can look at that. So in our previous interactions with this, uh, with this data set, go we looked at for example all of our products that have a five star review but notice that like these five reviews here are all for the same product right so we have a lot of different reviews about similar products so what might actually be more interesting would be to see what is the average review rating for a product, right? So to do that, we could use our aggregation pipeline. Sorry, I didn't mean for that to run. Can I type clear here? Oh, CLS, there we go. Right, we could run our aggregation pipeline like this. We could say db.reviews.aggregate. We want to group by common values of an ASIN, and we want to create a or project an attribute that we're going to call rating, which is the average of all of the values of overall. That's the what the rating the star rating is uh, for each ASIN, and then we're going to sort in descending order by rating. So we get our five star reviews first and then on down the line are, you know, 4.9, 4.8 and, uh, and so forth. So this is going to give us the average rating of each one of our products. Okay. So as we do this, we'll type IT to iterate through to the next uh, response. But now each one of these is an individual product and this is the average rating. So we've got a lot to have a five star average. And then we start getting into some 4.9, 4.92, and uh, so forth down the line, right? So, of course, we could look, see what a product like this is. If this is another product that I have purchased, you're all just going to get A's in the class and we're going to call it a night. I actually almost purchased a microphone very similar to this not long ago, but not this exact one. So it's also a little bit, a little bit spooky, but yeah, so this is, uh, you know, the product that goes along with, uh, with this thing that we just, uh, looked at here, but, I actually would be a little bit skeptical of a product that has, um, you know, a perfect five star rating. Cause like this may just be one review that's five stars. So it would actually be kind of useful to also know the number of reviews that have been uh, left for a product, right? So we might uh, want to include in our aggregation, a summation of how many reviews have been left for that product. So we could add to our aggregation pipeline. And unfortunately, there is not a, uh, or we can't really use our count function like we've seen used uh, before when we said like db.uscounties.count. Uh, but we can just do a summation of the number one for every document that is returned in this aggregation pipeline. Okay, so if there's three documents, it's going to sum one three times, one plus one plus one equals three, right? So when we do this, we see that 
This product with a rating of five, this has 20 five-star reviews, right? We have 12 five-star reviews, 10 five-star reviews, and uh, on down the line. So just a couple of ways to make our, make our queries perhaps a little bit more useful. So of course, all this code is in the, uh, in the slides that are already posted to Canvas, so you can uh, kind of play around with that to your heart's content. You can load this into your own database, your own collection, and uh, yeah, have a lot of fun with that. So here's just another aggregate query, which is kind of similar to this SQL statement here and so forth down the line. So one thing I will point out here is that it is really nice that MongoDB has this kind of functionality built into it, and it's relatively good performance, right? Uh, recall when we tried to do any kind of uh, aggregate functions in HBase, uh, that's just so far from the native functionality of HBase that it wound up having to like create uh, map reduce jobs and it was like this big process and something that would take, you know, less than half a second in Postgres was taking like 15, 20 seconds in HBase, right? So HBase was very bad at this kind of uh you know, aggregate queries and functionality. MongoDB does a pretty good job of it. However, it does not do as good a job of it as Postgres and or a relational database in general. And that's because uh, like HBase, there is no schema to MongoDB. So whenever you, uh, you know, attempt to do some kind of calculation, MongoDB doesn't know ahead of time if there is even going to be a value for that attribute that you're doing that calculation from in the documents that are being returned. So it's just less efficient than relational databases can be with this sort of thing. So, you know, nice functionality to use here and there. I wouldn't say that this should be your tool of choice, like if doing this type of, uh, you know, aggregate query and basic statistical analysis and things like that is the core functionality you're looking for. Um, it would be a more common use case that you uh, bring the data out of MongoDB and into something like, uh, Power BI or Tableau or whatever, and do that kind of analytical function there. And then, you know, maybe that the results are stored back into MongoDB, right? Uh, but, you know, we do have, uh, you know, this functionality available to us, which is, uh, which is nice. All right, cool. So that's uh, kind of the end of our interaction with our data sets that we are familiar with. And uh, I want to introduce a new data set that is uh, quite a bit larger here. And uh, of course, tonight, our class night is, uh, is Tuesday. And in many households across the United States, uh, you know, Taco Tuesday is, uh, is celebrated on a, uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, my family probably, I don't know, in the last 15 or 20 minutes, uh, has started sitting down to a dinner. I, I get to dine on databases with you all on Tuesday nights, but they're probably sitting down and uh, maybe crafting a, a Taco Tuesday meal, something that might uh, look like this. So we're going to use this as kind of the, uh, you know, the motivation, the driving, uh, driving uh, interest for our interaction with this Open Food Facts database. So, uh, you can actually get quite a bit more information about this if you just go to uh, this world.openfoodfacts.org. This is a really neat uh, data set, a really neat kind of organization here. And uh, basically, this is a, kind of like a, an open source, uh, almost like kind of a Wikipedia of food and nutritional information. And the reason I say almost like Wikipedia is because everyone can contribute to this database, right? You can upload, you know, if you find something that's not in the database, you can upload the nutritional information yourself and that will be incorporated into uh, the data set. And so 
Uh, open Food Facts, you know, they gather data from many different sources, other like uh, food, uh, nutrition, aggregation websites. They get data directly from uh, like food manufacturers and, uh, and companies and things like that. So there's a lot of different data sources that they pull from. And um, I mentioned in the slides here that the version of Open Food Facts that's loaded into our MongoDB server uh, contains data about just over 1 million products. And last semester, at this exact uh, point in the, uh, in the lecture, I noticed that, oh my goodness, now they are up to, I think last semester it was 2.6 million products. Now it's uh, almost 3 million products in the Open Food Facts database, which is cool. I don't know, I don't know why there was such a rapid growth, uh, growth there. But last semester I said, wow, I wish I had noticed that there had been some kind of update to the database and it's so much bigger now because I would have downloaded that, put it on the MongoDB server and that's what we would be using. So um, I did go and download this much larger data set uh, a couple of days ago and I loaded it into a MongoDB and it's, uh, you know, quite a bit uh, quite a bit larger, but as I started querying it, I came to found, find that since it's three times larger, some of the examples that we use in class and that I'm specifically using to illustrate like the difference in performance of different queries, it made the queries take not 30 or 45 seconds, which is a kind of reasonable amount of time for us to wait on something to finish in class, uh, up to taking like two and a half, three, four minutes, uh, which I didn't want to just sit here in silence for three or four minutes uh, while we're demonstrating some of these queries. So uh, I decided to actually keep us at the old version of the database that has about a million products, uh, but there actually is more data here. But there's very seldom a time that I do not find a product in the database, even with you know only a million products loaded into it. So I don't know, your mileage may vary, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll have plenty of data there. But the, the data set with a million items in it is just big enough to kind of illustrate some of the complexity and problems you're going to experience interacting with big data without being like overly burdensome uh, time-wise in, in some of these demonstrations. So. So I mentioned illustrating some of the problems in interacting with big data. And I also mentioned that Open Food Facts is awesome because it pulls data from so many different sources, including people just being able to upload content. So that's great, but also bad because one of the things that we're going to come to find is this data is fairly messy. And there's like, a lot of attributes that are not really used for many of the products and we find things like the you know amount of fat and calories and sodium and protein and things like that to be stored in multiple different places in each document and sometimes in different formats and things like that so the data set can be a little bit painful to work with but that is part of the point of this uh, of this exercise and this interaction so just be kind of uh, forewarned about that but you can actually click around on this website and like you know manually click on something or search for something and get all of this uh, nutritional information but what we are going to be doing is if you go to uh, openfoodfacts.org slash data, and all of these URLs are uh, very clearly laid out in the uh, assignment file that's posted on Canvas, there are exports of the data that you are free to download and load into your own database server uh, and use how you wish, which is uh, what we've done here. So uh, they offer this in a lot of different formats, including an export from uh, MongoDB, a, uh, a plain old JSON export, a comma separated values export, an RDF file, uh, you know, a lot of different ways to uh, interact with this. So very cool that they have been so kind of forthcoming with different formats and, and uh, things like that. So that's pretty neat. So I, uh, I just downloaded this uh, JSON file and then imported that into MongoDB. Um, 
there is a link here to a text file, which is essentially the data dictionary that describes what's going on in this, uh, in this JSON file. So these are all of the attributes or all of the fields that you would expect to find in each one of the documents. Uh, so there's a barcode, there is a URL to the product page in Open Food Facts, uh, modification dates, uh, the type of packaging, the manufacturer, uh, all the nutrition facts, so uh, calories, which is described as uh, energy, kilojoules or kilocalories. So a couple of different ways of looking at your calories there, your fat, your lactose, your vitamin content, all of these different things. So uh, this, and again, the URL, the link for this data dictionary is specified in the assignment file. Um, as well as in the PowerPoint slides. So uh, you should be able to find that, but this is a good kind of roadmap uh, for you to be able to use for, uh, for interacting with this. So for our Taco Tuesday meal that's going on downstairs, like this is what our loadout might typically look like here. We have some, uh, some tortillas, we have our Cholula hot sauce, some refried beans, some uh, protein, some uh, Kroger branded uh, carnitas here, and then some uh, shredded cheese. And so on each one of these packages, of course, there is a UPC or a universal product code, right? This is the thing that when you're in the checkout line, they scan it and it beeps and looks up the uh, you know price in the, uh, in the database and they know how much to uh, charge you, right? So this UPC is the unique identifier in this Open Food Facts database. However, it is not perfect because all of the IDs in Open Food Facts use a 13-digit UPC. There are a few different variations of UPC that use 9, 11, 12, or 13 digits. So what I have observed in my interaction with this database is if you have a UPC that is shorter than 13 digits, if you just prepend zeros, if you put zeros at the front of it to pad it out to be 13 digits, you usually have pretty good success uh, finding that product in the database. So. Uh, for example, this is the UPC on the shredded cheese. It starts with this little zero at the beginning and ends with this one at the end here. Okay, so it's 0111058907 And that is in total 12 digits. So then I just put an extra zero in the front. And so if I run a query looking for this value here, um, that will show up in the database. Let's see. So for example, if I were to say db.products.find and I look for the ID, it is 00111096713 That's actually my carnitas here. Really, we don't find anything? That's not cool. Oh, <laughs> does anyone know why? I'm not in the Open Food Facts database. I don't have a collection in MGUH called products. And man, MongoDB doesn't even give me an error message. It just gracefully fails. It's like, oh, there's nothing in a collection called products because there is no collection called products. Don't get a lot of error messages with MongoDB. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to the Open Food Facts database by saying use OFF, right? And now if I do db.products.find, there we go, oh boy, that is a big, a big wall of stuff. Of course, I can make this look a little bit prettier by saying 4H print, JSON, and remember this is case sensitive. Everything has to be lowercase except for this E, which has to be uppercase. So if I run that, 
All right, now this is a little bit more human readable. So yeah, we see this is, you know, Kroger brand. Uh, here's the ingredients, pork, water, soybean oil, dextrose, salt, whatever. I keep scrolling up here. Yeah, here's the product name, seasoned pork carnitas. So here's a bunch of uh, a bunch of messy stuff, right? Here's some of the here's some of the mess I'm talking about here, right? So we've got what appears to be maybe a list of the ingredients. We saw them previously just kind of listed out here and in one value. But now they're like separated out into multiple values, but then there's a whole bunch of null values kind of scattered in there. That's not very helpful. But then I'll also point out here that the name of this attribute is ingredients underscore debug. And if you've ever done any programming or been around programmers or computers in general, you've probably heard the term debugging, right? Which is like troubleshooting, trying to figure out what's going on. So I'm guessing maybe this is something that was just kind of left in by a developer or something. And this is like debugging information, maybe not really intended to be used, but it's just mess that we've got to uh, deal with. But if we keep scrolling up, so yeah, this is one of what I have found to be one of the most uh, kind of valuable uh, attributes here or data objects here, which is this nutriments object, right? And we know it's an object because the value is wrapped in this curly brace, okay? So this nutriments object has all of these attributes that make it up. Uh, vitamin C, calcium, sodium, you know, whatever. But inside this nutriments object, uh, this seems to be where kind of the most reliable description of the calories and fat and sodium and things like that are. But even at this, we'll find that the calories are captured in a couple of different ways. Uh, so this energy 100 grams, this is saying it's 1,084 calories per 100 grams. Uh, then there's also the energy per serving, which is 22 or 220, right? And then there's another uh, energy in the entire product, which is even higher. I don't know. There's a lot of different values here that are described in that data dictionary file. And, you know, you may want to kind of pick and choose and look at different options for uh, what you are using uh, in, your, uh, in your assignment and in your analysis. Uh, there also is this uh, NutraScore, which is like a USDA uh, just kind of general ranking one to five of how healthy a, a food is. So that's another uh, attribute that can be kind of interesting, but yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff to kind of sort through here. So anyway, that's kind of a very basic way to query uh, to query our data set here. Okay, so that's what we just did in the slide. Uh, we could also project you know, just a subset of things that we were interested in, right? So we could do something like this. So we're gonna look at our same product, uh, but this time we're going to project just a subset of attributes that UPC, the name, brand, serving size, uh, calories, fat, and carbohydrates. Okay, so when we project kind of a smaller subset of things, we can see that this is a little bit easier to understand, right? This is our Kroger, Kroger seasoned pork carnitas. A serving is three ounces or 85 grams. And we have 17 grams of fat, 259 calories, and 1.18 carbohydrates in a serving. Okay, so we've gotten rid of some of that, some of that messy stuff now. If we wanted to think about the nutrition of all of these foods that are in our uh, in our Taco Tuesday meal, though, we could also query for multiple products at the same time. And so, in the asynchronous lectures, it talks about using this in operator to say that we want to find products where the value of ID is in 
this array of values that we pass in. And we know it's an array because we have it wrapped in these square braces, right? This is just all of our JSON-like data type formatting. We wrap arrays in square braces, we wrap objects in curly braces, we wrap strings of text in quotation marks, right? This is uh, what we talked about last week. So we're gonna find all of our products that have a value of ID that is in this set of values, and this is just the five UPC codes that go along with these five products here. And we're gonna project the name, brand, serving size, calories, fat, and carbohydrates. So when we do that, great. So we've got more stuff here. So we've got our data about our tortillas. We've got our data about our refried beans, our carnitas, our cheese, and uh, oh yeah, and our uh, chua hot sauce. Cool, so we've got now kind of the individual data values that we're looking in, but this might be useful to think about, well, not just looking at the uh, health of these products individually, but we wanna see like how healthy is this meal collectively, right? Everything together. So we could use our aggregation pipeline for that, right? So, Uh, that was silly of me to clear the screen because then that gets everything behind my PowerPoint here. There we go. So we can use our aggregation pipeline to say that we want to match. So this is kind of like our where documents where the value of ID is in this set of values, these are our UPC codes, and then we want to group them all together, and we're gonna just give this an ID of meal health, right? We're just gonna, this is something we're just making up. This is the name of our grouping, and we're going to say that the calories is going to be the sum of this nutriments.energy value for each one of these products. And then our fat's going to be the sum of the nutriments.fat value, and our carbs is going to be the sum of the nutriments.carbohydrates. Okay. So when we run this, now we get a response that says, hey, our total calories in this meal with these five products is 1,000 calories with 55 grams of fat and 58 grams of carbs. Hmm. So that's... Uh, that's interesting stuff, right? So maybe we could now with this knowledge, like look for ways to make this meal healthier, right? If we substituted a different type of cheese or a different uh, refried bean or something like that, could we maybe bring down this uh, fat value or bring down the carbs or, uh, or something like that? So one thing we might want to do in pursuit of that would be to search for similar items in our database, right? So we can use our find command. We could say something like uh, db.products.find. Uh, Oops. And we're going to look for the product name attribute, okay, it's just one of the attributes in this uh, collection, again, described in that data dictionary. We want to look for a product name that contains the term refried beans, okay? And so previously, when we had, when we had having to go back too far. Here we go. Previously, when we had something like this, where the value is wrapped in quotation marks, we were looking for this exact value, okay? That's why it's wrapped in quotation marks. Uh, what we're doing here, though, with these slashes, 
is telling our find command that this is a regular expression that we are evaluating. And we've talked a little bit about regular expressions. We'll talk about them a little bit throughout the rest of the semester, but uh, we unfortunately don't really have the uh, time to go super in depth into regular expressions because they get pretty complex pretty quickly. But uh, at a very high level, this is telling us that we're just searching for this value to be anywhere in the value of this attribute product name. Okay, so that's why we're using these slashes instead of just quotation marks because we don't want exactly refried beans. We want any product that has the words refried beans uh, anywhere in it. Okay, so we run this. And it takes just a second. I mean, not not all that long. And uh, we get and we get a uh, wait a second. Is this the query I meant to run? Oh, I was typing this out myself instead of just copying and pasting. And I realize now I didn't type the entirety of the command that I meant to type. Okay, so we're searching for refried beans, but so everything isn't so messy here, let's project to just a subset of attributes that we are interested in. So I'm gonna say let's project the uh, only the product name attribute. There we go. So this is gonna project the ID because that is by default projected, and then also the product name. Okay, so when you run this, it takes just a second to start, but then we see the first uh, 20 or so items here, right? We have this 100% uh, salsas, veggie refried beans, Allen's refried beans, Amy's organic, traditional refried beans, and so on. It says, hey, if you wanna see more, type IT, that's short for iterate. So we type IT, we get like 20 more. IT again, we get some more. I type IT again, some more, some more, some more, some more. And then finally it says no cursor. And I am realizing that I didn't undo something that I needed to do as part of the demonstration, as part of the point I'm trying to make here. So I am going to momentarily, oh gosh, how do I make things just go? Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to momentarily change something and do this example again. So give me just a moment to kind of reset something here. I always run through these examples before class to make sure everything is going to work. Occasionally, there's something I have to undo so that the point can be made, and I forgot to do the undo portion of that. So here we are. All right, pretending none of that ever happened. Let's imagine we want to find other refried beans that we could use. So this is the command that we just ran here, db.products.find, product name, where refried beans is anywhere in there, and then we're projecting just product name, and ID is going to be projected by default. So when I run this, it's going to take just a second for this query to start executing. So we wait, wait, wait. And after just a few seconds, there we go, we see our first uh, 20 or so instances of refried beans, vegetarian refried beans, traditional refried beans, and so forth. We can type IT to iterate into the next uh, set of results. More refried beans, more refried beans, keep getting more. Now at a certain point, we get to the end of like, the first batch that MongoDB found, and now it's saying, okay, well, let me check and see if there's more. It's doing more searching for us, so it's taking 
Just a moment here. Oh, we found a couple more refried beans. Type IT again, we found some more. Ah, and then we get to no cursor, saying that this is all of the refried beans or all of the documents that have a value that includes the term refried beans for product name. Great, so we have a bunch of different options here, right? We could also have like printed out the nutrition information so we could see if there's a better choice to make our meal a little bit healthier. So cool that MongoDB was able to find all of these documents in this collection that contains over a million documents. And I mean, it was not terribly slow, but we were sitting here for a minute. So let's actually quantify what this performance is. So we can get some additional insight into what's going on behind the scenes in MongoDB by appending another option to this command. And that is to say dot explain, and then in parentheses and quotation marks, execution stats, like this. So when we do this, MongoDB is not going to show us the output from this command, but it is going to give us some kind of technical details about what was happening in the background. But this is going to take approximately the same amount of time to run that uh, running that command originally did. So we'll let this run for uh, just a moment here. And any moment now, it's going to give us the information that we have asked for. And here we are. So we get a lot of uh, kind of technical details that we're not going to really discuss right now. But if you scroll up just a little bit, okay, yeah, right here is what we're interested in. Uh, we find that we returned 128 documents. So we have 128 like cans of refried beans uh, in this data set. Out of the total documents examined, the 1,058,873, and this query took 42,773 milliseconds, right? There's a thousand milliseconds in a second, so this took 42, almost 43 seconds to find these 128 refried beans in this uh, set of 1 million and something documents, right? So that's, that's pretty cool, but 42 seconds is kind of a long time. I didn't like sitting here for, uh, for that long necessarily. And this is the exact example that I said with the new data set of almost 3 million, uh, this winds up taking like three and a half minutes or something, which would have been even more awkward for me to sit here uh, in silence while that happens. So one thing we can do to pretty dramatically improve the performance of a query like this, and this is not specific to MongoDB or document databases, most databases have this concept of creating an index uh, that is used to speed up operations uh, or like search operations on attributes that we think we uh, are going to be searching on, right? So if we want to create an index in MongoDB, we just say db.products.insure index, and that I has to be capitalized, and then the uh, attribute that we want to create the index for. In this case, we'll say product name, and then we say colon one, saying that true, this is the attribute we want to create the uh, index for, okay? If we put a zero here, then we would be saying we don't want an index for this, which wouldn't really make sense in the context of this command. So we're gonna create an index here. This will take roughly as long as running that query took uh, because it is having to go through all the documents and create an index of the values 
uh, that are part of that attribute. So this can be a, a time intensive and also a CPU intensive process, right? If you are creating this index in order to uh, speed up a query that takes 45 minutes to run, then it would take 45 minutes or maybe even more to create that index and your CPU is going to be high while you're doing that. So generally creating indexes in any DBMS, relational or non-relational, is something that you want to do uh, off hours, right? You wanna do this during a maintenance window or at like two in the morning when there's not a lot of people using the system because it is going to degrade the rest of the system performance. But now that we have this index created, running this same query to find all of our refried beans is a lot faster. So how much faster? Uh, we found of course the same 128 documents and it took 909 milliseconds. So about nine tenths of a second. So we went from 44 seconds down to a little bit under a second just by creating this index. So indexing is a very powerful tool for uh, being able to make your queries uh, faster. So I imagine that you all will be wanting to search for different product names and things like that. So I'm gonna leave this uh, index in, uh, in place for you, but you can create other index indices um, as you might need them. Now, another query that you might be interested in running is to find like all of your diet friendly foods, right? All of our low calorie foods. Okay. So we might want to do something like this. Right. So we're going to find all of our products and instead of passing our, well, we have to use this, uh, you know, kind of strange postfix notation uh, to do this and operation. If we wanted to find all of our products that have a value for energy that is greater than 50 and less than 100. Okay, so if we want to find products that are between 50 and 100 calories, we could write a query that looks something like this and we would get these products in return. We get some things like uh, I don't know, some type of salad thing, uh, some type of, my product names are all kind of in weird, weird spots here, but let's see. Like this salmon, right? Some type of uh, salsa stuff, different things here. So you might be asking the question, so why did I put a floor on calories, right? If I'm trying to find my lowest calorie foods, wouldn't I just want to say, you know, sort by calorie in ascending order and the things that are at the bottom are going to be the, the lowest calorie foods? I started with that approach. And what I found is if you don't put this floor of 50 calories, all of your results are things like water, and hot sauce and mustard and things that are like zero calories or five calories or, or something like that. And those aren't really foods, right? That doesn't really answer the question of, hey, I'm trying to do some meal planning and find low calorie foods, right? Because if you were like running a restaurant or something and your, your boss tasked you with, oh, I make a very diet friendly meal and you said okay here boss here's your meal it's water hot sauce and mustard like yeah maybe you technically created a low calorie meal but like that's not a meal right and that is one thing that i want you to keep in mind in your assignments and in your project and stuff like that and in your life as a data analytics professional is your interpretation of the data and the results and making sure that it's not just a technically correct answer, but that it is also a reasonably correct answer uh, for the business case at hand, right? And so you might wind up having to kind of tweak some of your uh, queries and your data values and maybe clean your data a little bit uh, in order to avoid 
uh, you know, having a solution that is perhaps technically correct, but doesn't really make sense in the, uh, in the context of the problem. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, well, yeah, actually let's, uh, let's not get into that, but we do have the example here of uh, kind of the difference in performance that we might expect to see if we were to index like this calorie uh, attribute, right? And we find that this query that we just ran here, I'm just thinking, I don't think there is a an end to this. Oh, actually there is an end to this. Yeah, because I put a, a maximum of 100 calories, right? So we see a kind of similar situation to what we had before and that we find or MongoDB returns our first, you know, few dozen results pretty quickly. And now it's waiting, 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 waiting. Waiting. We find that if we create an index on this calorie attribute, we can pretty substantially increase the performance. And in the example as it's illustrated in the slide, it takes us from this query taking uh, about 14 seconds to run down to about two and a half seconds to run, which is not the same level of performance gain that we saw with the product name attribute, or we went from 45 seconds to a little under a second, but still a pretty substantial gain. And the reason we don't see as substantial as of a gain here is that the process of indexing uh, string attributes, like a product name, is a little bit different than the process of indexing numeric attributes, okay? And we just don't get the same uh, view here because strings are, uh, kind of a finite combination of of characters, right? Uh, whereas these numeric values are an infinite, you know, range of possible numbers. So the the algorithms that are used for the indexing and the search process is just a little bit different. So while we do see a great performance increase here, it's just kind of a different uh, a different animal when you're indexing on numeric values as opposed to uh, as opposed to strings. And I think the uh, Perkins book, yeah, Perkins book goes into a little bit more detail of the, uh, you know, different types of indexing that's going on there. So if you're interested, good, uh, good reading there. All right, so this is kind of the type of mindset you should be in for assignment three. So uh, of course the assignment file that's on Canvas goes into quite a bit of depth about the uh, expectation and deliverables, but at a very high level, what you're going to be doing in assignment three is kind of like what we did tonight. Uh, I'd like for you to identify five to 10 uh, items that you might find uh, in your pantry or at the grocery store that might go together as part of a uh, meal or that you might serve as snacks at a, uh, at a party or something like that. And explore the data in this open food facts database to ask and answer a couple of uh, interesting questions, right? So, um, you know, you identify your five or 10 food items. You might want to look at the, uh, you know, different nutritional content. You might want to look at the variety of the ingredients, or maybe if you have brand loyalty toward a certain, uh, a certain brand or manufacturer or something like that, you know, do you have very simple items that are made up of a small number of ingredients, like kind of natural whole foods, or do you have these uh, very processed uh, food items that have, you know, 75 different ingredients? all of which are like hard to pronounce and stuff, right? So just kind of come up with some cohesive story that brings these individual products together, ask and answer some interesting questions, and then think about like ways you might build on that, right? If there are ways that you could take this uh, set of 
food items and make it healthier or more delicious or more diet friendly or more, uh, I don't know, similar or different in some ways, something uh, like that. So yeah, pick out a couple of items, run some queries to ask and answer some uh, interesting questions. And uh, that's what you're going to be reporting on in the assignment. But again, more details in the assignment file itself and uh, also kind of the same general way of thinking that you should be thinking about the uh, upcoming case project, right? Where we find a data set and we think of some interesting questions uh, that we can ask and answer with that data. And then we run the queries and do the analysis to answer those questions. And we write up our findings and present it in an interesting and meaningful way. So that is assignment three. Um, any questions about the data set or the assignment or the uh, case project that's uh, coming up here in just a couple of weeks? And one thing I, one thing I will point out about this uh, data set here, you do not need to download anything at all from uh, Open Food Facts. Uh, everything is here on the uh, Mongo DB server, uh, you have access to the OFF database. Um, do be careful not to like delete the database, right? Uh, make sure you're just doing uh, read operations and leaving it in a good state for uh, everyone else. But yeah, the database is already out there for you. You don't need to download or install anything there. Um, yeah, any other questions, comments, or concerns there? Well, if not, uh, this is yeah about how much time I promised we would be using in class tonight. So uh, we can get things wrapped up. Of course, for next week, October 10th, uh, we're going to be continuing discussing about document databases, but we're going to be discussing a different document database as we introduce CouchDB. So uh, you know, watch the uh, video series eight about uh, CouchDB. This is actually the most popular series of videos on my uh, YouTube channel, which I think is uh, is kind of interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of demand for knowledge about CouchDB, but it's not as popular of a database as MongoDB, so there's not as many uh, videos on uh, YouTube about it. So uh, these videos tend to attract a lot of attention, but I think the other side of that coin is that that may be an indicator that there's a lot of interest about CouchDB and not a lot of people with this expertise. So this is gonna be a really nice and perhaps unique skill set uh, that you're picking up here. So hopefully you uh, do pick up that skill and feel good about it. Um, but yeah, watch uh, video series eight. Of course, this assignment we just discussed will be due at uh, six o'clock uh, next week. And then also read Perkins chapter five, uh, which you know is kind of our uh, lab-based discussion of MongoDB. So I'll be reaching out to uh, each of the groups uh, with a link uh, for our scheduled uh, Zoom meeting. Um, I think most of the meetings are scheduled for, I think for tomorrow actually. So yeah, let me, I'll go ahead and send out Zoom links uh, for these meetings. Um, you uh, might also want to consider installing CouchDB on your computer, like on your laptop. Uh, one of the things we'll be doing in class for next week is actually setting up replication uh, from a local installation to our shared uh, CouchDB environment and kind of demonstrating how uh, some of that works. So uh, yeah, it's, good, uh, it's a good exercise to uh, go through. But um, if you do have any questions or anything between now and next week, uh, of course, send me an email and uh, I'll try to help you over email or we can set up a Zoom meeting and have a little discussion. But I will be talking to each one of the groups uh, too. So uh, yeah, look forward to all of these upcoming interactions. That's all I've got for you tonight. So you all go forth and do great things and we'll see you next week.